So the Wheel of Time Season 1 has come and gone, and overall I can say I wasn't a big fan of this. And after having read Eye of the Wild and revisiting some of the episodes in Season 1, yeah, I'm not a big fan of it. Especially considering it's not a great adaptation of The Eye of the World. I mean, on paper, you could call the show a very loose adaptation of The Eye of the World because certain things in the books do happen in the show, but it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one adaptation of the book, which to me is a problem just because the plot of the book is better than the plot of the show. I don't want to be that guy, but for me, almost nine times out of ten, the book is always better than the film adaptation, the TV adaptation, whatever. It's normally better. And so today I'm going to pitch to you guys how I would fix The Wheel of Time Season 1. This is essentially me just going through a beat sheet of seven episodes. Yes, you heard me right, seven episodes of how I would fix The Wheel of Time Season 1. Going plot point by plot point of what I would include, giving you guys a brief idea of the tone of the episode, of what is going to happen in the episodes, essentially, you know, culminating in the finale where we end the show for season one. Now, you may be thinking, seven episodes? Yeah, I think you can tell the eye of the world in seven episodes. Bear in mind, that is seven hours of television. Six and a bit if we're doing 55 minute long episodes, but still, that is more or less an hour every episode. Most films we get nowadays are roughly two hours long, and most of those films tend to fit in a lot of things into that two hour runtime. Also, this is totally not me disputing the fact that Rafe Judkins, the showrunner of The Wheel of Time Season 1, had eight episodes to tell the eye of the world, but you know. Also, bear in mind, this isn't me going, this is my treatment for the show, this is how I'd want certain things to look, etc, etc. It's mainly focusing on the story, though I will say, I do have two caveats before we start. Number one is keeping the cast, because overall, I liked the cast. The only exception I would change is Min, because the actor portraying Min is just way too old and doesn't fit the character. Min, to me, when I read the book, is definitely a character that's roughly the same age as Rand. But also, she very much reminded me of Ivana Lynch's Luna Lovegood, and so I would cast someone with that type of demeanour for Min, because that's just how I read the character in the book. She is fun and flirty, but she can also be a bit weird, because I remember Rand's reaction to meeting Min the first time, and listening to her spout all these uh, visions she can see of the future of Rand, and how she's like, oh, Gwen won't be yours, uh, you're not made for each other, whatever. He was very much just like, okay, you're weird, bye. And so when recasting men, I would find an act that is able to portray that sort of side to the character. Number two, I'm changing the Heron Mark sword to actually look like the Heron Mark sword from the books, because I'm sorry, the katana we got in the show is lame. It's not even a cool looking katana. I mean, Chad from Shadowversity did a whole breakdown of why the sword in the show just isn't that cool. And so, yeah, we're changing the sword to look like this. Right, that's uh, all my caveats out the way. Let's just get into it. So episode one is going to start off with the prologue from the Eye of the World. We see Luz there in the dragon, essentially going mad, walking into the palace, looking for his wife, his children, finding out that they are dead. Ishamayel appears to him, goes, Ah, oh, Luz Theron Kinslayer, you've killed your family. Luz Theron then realizes he has killed his family, goes insane, then uses his power to commit suicide, but also use that energy to create Dragon Mount. And as Luz Theron is doing this, you know, channeling his power, creating Dragon Mount, committing suicide, using all this energy and pain to create the mountain, I might have a narration of Rosamund Pike's Moraine being like, the last dragon broke the world, blah blah blah, the wheel wheeze as the wheel wills. We would then transition into the scene with Rand and Tam walking down the country road, and we wouldn't do what they did in the show where they cut the scene short, which essentially made the scene almost null and void, because the whole point is that in the books they're walking down this peaceful, calm country road, and then Rand sees a fade for a split second, and then that creates that uneasy feeling of, oh, something bad is going to happen here. We would then actually spend some time in the two rivers and learn about the Emmonsfield Five. We would learn about Perrin, Matt, Rand, Egwene, Nynaeve. We would see the two rivers functioning as a village, as a community. We would see the smaller characters mentioned in the book, like Mistress Alvir, Egwene's father, the mayor. The main goal here is to make the two rivers feel lived in, like a community. There would be mentioned of wisdoms, rumours of war, we would name drop Loghain. We would also show that Matt's dad is not a drunk or a womanizer and that his parents are not horrible people. Perrin also does not have a wife and Rand and Egwene are not having sex. 
The dynamic I want to portray between Rand and Egwene is two people that very much care and like one another, but are not meant to be for each other. We would do it like how it's done in the book, where Egwene would say something and then Rand would either say the wrong thing, or he would say something that Egwene would be disapproving of. We're also going to introduce Tom in episode one. He's going to come into the village and everyone's going to crowd around him, all excited because, I mean, he's a gleeman. He's theatrical. He is a showman. We'll also have a little scene introducing Padan Fane, maybe establish the dynamic between him and Matt. And I'd say roughly about half an hour into this hour-long 55-minute episode, we will introduce Lan and Moraine. They're going to walk into the tavern and it's going to be like the scene of the book where everyone is hospitable towards them, but there is a lot of talk around the town. We'll have Matt, Rand, and Perrin sitting at a table talking about the Aes Sedai. Matt will go on about rumours about Aes Sedai and her warder, and then Tom will come along and be like, guys, it's best for you to stay cautious when around an Aes Sedai. They're not always as what they seem. Moraine will then introduce herself to the boys, and they'll start talking, and then we will find a way to have Moraine give them the coin, so that later on in the show she can track them like she does in the books. We then cut to Rand and Tam's house, where Tam and Rand are sort of just settling down for the night. It's the Winter Night Festival in the village, and they're just, you know, they're chilling like they are in the book. And then the Trollocs attack we will then show the events of the Winter Night Festival, the Trollocs attack, and Moraine and Land will be seen fending off the Trollocs in the village. We will then cross cut back to Rand and Tam back at home. Tam pulls out the Heronmark sword, he fends them off, Rand tries to help, but then Tam gets injured and Rand gets him away to safety. That's how the episode would end, it would essentially end with the Trolloc attack on Winter's Night. Episode 2 then starts with Rand carrying Tam back to the village, they go through the forest, Rand then takes a break and then Tam starts muttering all his delirious murmurings and essentially reveals to Rand that he isn't his son. Rand then gets them to the village, they see the destruction, the carnage the Trollocs have made during the Winter Night attack, and then they go to find Nynaeve. Nynaeve sees them and then goes, I can't really do anything for him Rand, the best I can do is ease his pain before he dies, but we're going to have Moraine then walk in and heal Tam. This scene will also show the aftermath of the Winter Night attacks and how the people of the Two Rivers are coping with said attack. Moraine then tells the three boys that they have to leave with her because if they stay, more Trollocs will come and another attack will happen at the Two Rivers. Egwene tags along like she does in the book and so does Tom Merrillin, obviously to keep an eye on the boys and see that Moraine doesn't see them to harm. Moraine would also address the village like she does in the show and basically be like, guys, we have to go because if not, more will come and your village is not prepared for it. So allow us to go. There is some hesitancy from the village folk, but eventually they all agree that they have to leave. As they head off to Berlon, we're going to keep the Manetherin song scene from the show because I actually do really like that scene. I think Rosamund Pike delivers the speech really well, and I also just like the sound of the Manetherin song. Weep for Manetherin, weep for the blood of Amon. So night falls as they reach Taran Ferry, they then cross the river, Moraine then sinks the ferry, and they move on. Though I am tempted to keep in the ferryman going, but my son, and have him jump into the river, but then I would have Moraine save him, just, you know, because, I don't know, I found that to be one of my favourite parts of the Wheel of Time show, but that's just because Oz from Night's Watch just made it a meme. No! No! It's the only way to get my son across! I don't know, I'll let you guys in the comments decide which version you want to see. My version, which is just they cross and they leave, or we keep in the book, my son! But then we have Moraine save him at the end. They get to Berlon, they check into the Stag and Lion Inn, and then Moraine and Lan tell them all to keep a low profile. Matt and Rand then wander the streets and they run into Pad and Fane. And then later on in the episode, there's going to be a scene in the Stag and Lion where there's sort of a dance going on. Rand and Egwene dance for a bit and it's meant to be awkward, but also cute and sweet. It's going to be a chance for the actors to show their chemistry as well for the characters. We need to buy the fact that Rand and Egwene really do like each other, but they're just not meant to be. Rand then runs into Min and they talk for a bit. She then talks about glimpses of his future to him, essentially going that him and Egwene are not meant to be. So we are just establishing that this uh, relationship between Rand and Egwene is bittersweet and is not meant to be. Almost closing off the episode on a bittersweet tone, we'll then get a dream sequence with Balsamon. Rand wakes up sweating and panting. He maybe looks over to Matt and Perrin who they're sharing a room with and they both go, did you guys have the same dream? Setting up that intriguing mystery of one of the three could be the dragon, but I mean, we know it's technically Rand. Also, we do need to set up the threat of Balsamon and how he can you know, sink his teeth into the characters just through their dreams.
Episode 3 then opens with Nynaeve tracking them all to the Stagon Line Inn and essentially trying to take all the kids home, but they refuse and show to her the importance of what they're doing, and so she then joins the company. The company then leave Baelon and start making their way off to Shadal Agoth. Well, technically they're making their way towards Camelin, but they have to take the route via Shadal Agoth. They then camp in the forest for the night, and Moraine then tells Nynaeve and Egwene that they can both channel. This scene will also serve to expand the lore of the Aes Sedai, the difference between Saidar and Saidin, and also communicate to the audience what the Aes Sedai do and the idea of the One Power. We'll also start seeding in the relationship between Lan and Nynaeve. At the moment, it's just a semblance of flirtatious bickering. The Trollocs and Fades then catch up to them and they have to seek refuge in Shadalagoth. Matt, Rand, and Perrin then start to explore the ruins of Shadalagoth. They run into Mordith, who then does the scene from the book where he's like, I can offer you riches and treasure if you help me. In this scene, we will also see Matt take the dagger from Shadalagoth. The Trollocs are then able to get into Shadalagoth and the company splits. Rand, Matt, and Tom are together. Perrin and Egwene are together. Lan and Moraine are together, and Nynaeve is separated from all of them as well, but Nynaeve will then, in the following episodes, track Lan and Moraine and join up with them. So episode 4 opens with Ran, Matt and Tom finding a moored ship and are taken upriver by the crew. Tom barters their way onto the ship saying that he will perform for them as a gleeman. And during this whole voyage, Tom starts teaching Rand and Matt the ways of being a gleeman, teaching them how to be a showman. As they head down the river, we get more battles among dreams between Matt and Rand, and we'll also start seeing Matt deteriorate a little bit, being corrupted by the dagger. Seeing Matt's deteriorating state, Tom will then tell them the story about his nephew who could channel, but that was then gentled by the eyes to die. And then when they are dropped off in Whitebridge, they're going to seek refuge in an inn, only for them to run into a dark friend and then get attacked by fades. Tom then sacrifices himself, allowing Matt and Rand to escape. Escape. And that's going to conclude the subplot with Matt and Rand and Tom in this episode. Now, catching up with Perrin and Egwene, they both run into Elias, who then starts teaching Perrin the ways of the wolf and his ability to communicate with the wolves. Elias then agrees to take them on a route that will lead them to Camelin, but then they bump into the Tinkers and end up traveling with the Tinkers for a bit. Perrin is then lectured by the Tinkers on the way of the leaf, and Aram starts flirting with Egwene. Perrin gets defensive, but it is not because he is in love with Egwene, it's because he is standing up for his homeboy Rand. The next day, they separate from the Tinkers and wander the woods until they are cornered by White Cloaks. Episode 5 then opens with Nynaeve tracking Lan and Moraine. They meet up, Nynaeve is all like, how are you going to find them? What the hell? Where are they? And Moraine's all like, oh, don't worry, I have my ways. Obviously hearkening back to the pieces of silver she gave them all in episode 1. Still cornered by White Cloaks, Perrin uses his wolf ability to kill one of the White Cloaks. There's a commotion about Elias escapes in all the commotion, but Perrin and Egwene are imprisoned by the White Cloaks and are being transported to be executed. When the White Cloaks make camp, Moraine, Land, and Nynaeve begin their rescue attempt on Perrin and Egwene. They are successful and they then start making their way towards Camelin. We then join Matt and Rand going from farm to farm, seeking food and shelter. This part of the episode is essentially going to adapt one of my favorite bits from the Eye of the World book when uh, Matt and Rand stay at the farmer's house and the farmer's daughter is all obsessed with Rand. I really like that chapter, so I kind of want to spend some time with it in the episode. You know, about 15 minutes, nothing too egregious. So, yep, they're staying at the farmer's house, they're doing some of the farmer's chores, but also they perform for them as a little treat. We then obviously get a scene where the farmer's daughter is very clearly flirting and obsessed with Rand. We're then going to have some more battles among dreams, you know, just as you do. They then leave the next morning and then hire a cart that will take them to Camelin. They're obviously hiding under the covers because it's a farmer's cart. At this moment in time, we're also going to have Matt and Rand both be sick. So they're basically just going to be like all sweaty and gnarly under the cover. And essentially, you know daydreaming, having battles among dreams. It'll be intercut with all the Perrin, Egwene, Lana, Moraine scenes, so it won't be too jarring of just, you know, a scene of them just laying in a cart being sick. And so I'd say around about the 40 minute mark, Matt and Rand finally arrive in Camelin. They seek lodgings in an inn, Rand then bumps into Loyal. Matt is stuck in the room being sick, obviously corrupted by the dagger. After the scene where Rand interacts with Loyal, he hears a crowd and a commotion outside. He sees that Loghain is being paraded through the streets, and so intrigued, he starts climbing up a tree and up a wall, trying to get a better look at Loghain. Loghain stares directly at him, freaking Rand out, and Rand ends up falling out of the trio wall into the Queen's Palace, ending the episode.
So episode 6 then opens with Rand meeting the Princess Elaine and her brother. He is then taken in by the guards and brought before the Queen Morghese. They interrogate him for a bit, but he is then set free. Rand then heads back to the inn and is reunited with Moraine, Lan, Egwene, Perrin, Matt, Loyal. Moraine then temporarily heals Matt's sickness from the dagger. Moraine then consults them on their plan to get to the Eye of the World and that they need to take the ways. And so the group then re-meets Loyal and they head off to the gates and Loyal helps them get through the ways. They then enter the ways and honestly, I probably just keep the sequence in the way as more or less as it was in the show but with Matt obviously we're not going to lose our actor halfway through shooting and to be honest I did quite like the sequence where the black mist swept all over them and was like whispering all their darkest deepest secrets and fears into their ears I liked that and so I'd keep that in my version of the show they then get out of the ways and then reach Faldara they are then greeted by Lord Algamar who is obviously courteous towards Moraine because Moraine is an Aes Sedai and he holds her in great respect Lord Algamar then shows them the captured Padan fame which you know allows us to set up the second season of the show and the second book The Great Hunt and in the sequence where we show Padan Fane it's revealed that he is a dark friend and works for the Dark One. The last 10 minutes of the episode I would say is some downtime it's the night before they leave to head off towards the Blight and then the episode will then leave off with them entering the Blight. So episode 7 is going to be my version of the finale. It's going to be the company in the Blight. They then run into the Green Man who then takes them to the Eye of the World. As this is happening we then see the armies of Faldara assembling and heading towards the Gap where they will fight the Fades and the Trollocs. The Green Man then leads the company to the Eye of the World and we see the Pool of Sidin. But as this happens they are then confronted by the two Forsaken, Agenor and Balthamel. Battle then ensues. Most of the company gets overpowered. The Green Man kills Balthamel. Moraine is fighting Agenor. However, Agenor is able to overpower Moraine and then kills the Green Man. Agnor then turns towards the Pool of Sidene, getting ready to channel it, but then we're gonna have Rand jump in the way, Heron Mark's sword aloft, he's ready for battle. There's going to be fear in Rand's eyes because this is very clearly a stupid thing to do, but Rand is the hero and we have to make him stupid but also impulsive and brave. There's a scuffle between the two of them, we're really showing that sort of tug of war that Robert Jordan described in the books, and then Finally, we're going to see Rand's eyes light up white. This is essentially going to be his Thor arriving in Wakanda from Infinity War or Thor, you know, channeling his true power at the end of Thor Ragnarok. His eyes are going to light up, lightning's going to fly everywhere, and Rand starts channeling the side in. <laughs> Rand then essentially goes into god mode, he starts teleporting everywhere, electricity and lightning is flying everywhere, he's killing all the Trollocs in the Battle of Faldara, he then uh, teleports on top of the hill, Heron marks sword aloft, he then channels the lightning through the sword and defeats Agnar, Agnar explodes, and then Rand passes out. And whilst Rand is passed out, we're gonna have more battles among visions and dreams, like sort of think of it like the sequence in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix when Dumbledore beats Voldemort, but then Voldemort gets into Harry's mind. Sort of think of that. We're gonna have scenes from the books that fans would recognize. Obviously, I've only read Eye of the World, so I don't know what these scenes would be. But we can include things like Rand's birth at Dragon Mount, Rand's mother, Tam finding Rand, all that kind of stuff. When Rand wakes up, Moraine, Nynaeve, and Egwene find him, and Rand essentially realizes that he is the Dragon Reborn. The last 15 minutes of the episode is essentially downtime of Faldara. We get the conversation between Rand and Egwene, where Rand is like, Egwene, I'm the Dragon Reborn, I don't want to touch the One Power ever again, I don't want to be the Dragon Reborn, but this is my curse, so I'm going away. And then the last shot is essentially Moraine looking at the two of them, with a narration basically going, the dragon is at last reborn. And of course, the wheel weaves as the wheel wills. So yeah, that's essentially my treatment for my version of the Wheel of Time Season 1, essentially translating the eye of the world to the small screen as it should have been done properly. Now, it's not perfect, and this is just a beat sheet, like, I haven't written scripts for any of this, but if I did have the time to do it, and I was being commissioned to do it, like, if all of a sudden Amazon was just like, hey Hamza, we want you to reboot Wheel of Time, I'd essentially give them this as my treatment before I would eventually get down to the nitty gritty of it, working out the character arcs, working out the dialogue, working out each of the scenes. Obviously, in the episodes where the company is split, it's not all just going to be like, oh, we're going to have like a 15 minute chunk of this of you know Rand and Matt doing this or we're gonna have like a 20 minute chunk of Egwene and Perrin doing this no no it would all be like intercut and cross-cutted like how they do in like Game of Thrones and all that this is just essentially a vague plot summary but at the end of the day it's my version of Wheel of Time season one how I would do it but yeah that's essentially how I would do the Wheel of Time season one pretty much just do Eye of the World but in TV show form and before I go I just want to address when people go Ah, uh, the showrunners had to change everything because they needed it to fit, you know, within the audience to make them understand this you can't just be made for book fans. 
that's just such a weird argument to me that I don't understand when people, you know, raise that when they're talking about book to film adaptations or book to TV adaptations, because the reason why they're turning a book into a TV show or a film is because of the book series, because of the popularity of it. And the people that made the books popular didn't know what The Wheel of Time was, they read it in the book. And so the show that they should be making should be representing what the book is about, not this made up weird show with random plot threads and false agendas. Just it didn't work. People were drawn to the book because the story was good, and so if the book story is good, turn the book story into the TV show or film. Anyway, ranting aside, that's how I would fix The Wheel of Time Season 1. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments down below. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, all that good stuff, and until we meet again, see you guys next time.